So um, thanks, everybody. It's my pleasure to be with you uh, for this armchair tour co-sponsored by the Historical Society of the NIACs and the NIAC Library. And I'm really pleased to spend some time talking with you about the Gilded Age by looking at photographs of two of NIAC's early photographers, Isaac Van Wagner and Frank Brush. As Rosemary mentioned, I'm drawing uh, some, but not all of the photographs for tonight's presentation from the exhibit that's currently um, on display at the muse uh, museum at 50 Piermont Avenue. Uh, we have over 50 photographs there, so you get a chance to explore this in greater detail. Um, I, we, you know, I need to say that we're really, I'm really thankful that uh, both the Nyack Library and the Perry family and the Wynn Perry Jr. Collection, uh, we really have to thank for preservation of these valuable photographs that give us some of the uh, only views we have of many, many of the places in, in Old Nyack. So we're really lucky to have them and really thankful that we can uh, share them with you today. How we're going to proceed tonight is uh, this way. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, just a quick overview of the Gilded Age, both in America and Nyack. Then we're going to jump over to uh, the first photographer, Isaac Van Wagner, talk a bit about him. Uh, I want to say something about a style of photograph he takes called the stereoscope. And then we're going to focus on a location, one of the important locations of the Gilded Age Nyack Prospect Hotel. Then we're going to jump over to Frank Brush. We're going to talk a little bit about him and then focus on a, an upper Nyack estate called Undercliff, also an iconic Gilded Age photograph. And then we're going to close by just looking at a comparison of the styles of the two of them in their photographs of the Nyack Rowing Association Clubhouse, also another iconic Gilded Age um, building. So we're really going to take, uh, uh, you know, as many things we might talk about in the Gilded Age and Nyack, but we're going to focus on these three particular locations. Uh, first of all, uh, the Gilded Age in America. Um, just as a quick summary, it's roughly the period from 1870 to 1900. It was a time of booming, of a booming economy. Luxury and opulence were everywhere. The industrial barons, the railroads, uh, industrial barons, the Carnegies, Rockefellers, the Whitney's, and so forth were making huge amounts of money. And it was a time also of vast income inequality. Not so much different from today, you know, where we have the tech billionaires and a lot of people are just barely getting by, but vast disparity. It was named the Gilded Age by Mark Twain, and it's uh, pretty much a tongue-in-cheek name because uh, it means Gilded Age in terms of its opulence, but also it's just a covering. Uh, it's not, um, you know, something all the way through. It's not pure gold. At the same time, we had uh, this vast income inequality and a booming economy. We had d disputed elections in this period. There was a haze. Uh, versus a Tilden election in 1876 that was decided in the House of Representatives. As you may remember, that came back as uh, they, ch they changed the laws in order to make the, in order to try to clarify the Electoral College vote in the House in 1876. And then just 12 years later, uh, Cleveland running for his second term as a Democrat was uh, defeated by Benjamin Harrison in the uh, Electoral College again. Uh, Cleveland, both Cleveland and Tilden, won the won the popular vote. So again, another issue not totally dissimilar from our times. In terms of human rights, uh, it's a little hard to believe, but you know the women were not voting in this era, and it took a long time before women got the right to vote. So this is a period when the women's suffrage movement was really getting underway and getting in motion. Kind of went hand in hand with the temperance um, uh, movement. In terms of other minorities, there were a lot of immigrants from Europe um, that were having a, a hard time in struggling in America. And to say nothing of uh, at least the initial gains of African Americans after slavery was that, that you know, really disappeared and, and really bad things happened. Um, and so, they, so the minorities and the working poor had a really, really tough time. It was also a time of corruption in politics. You've heard of Tammany Hall in New York City where the politicians ruled the roost and were really mostly on the take. 
uh, working hand in hand with the police who were also on the take. So uh, corruption was a major issue in politics at the time. Uh, how did all this play out in NIAC? Well, NIAC, NIAC on the Hudson, as we called ourselves in those days, uh, was also referred to as NIAC as Jim of the Hudson in advertising. And why was it called the Jim of the Hudson? Well, we were a summer resort in this period. Uh, it was, we were a place where city dwellers, the well-off city, city dwellers could escape the heat in the city, you know, no air conditioning in those days. And there was a lot of disease to say nothing of malaria and other things. Um, and NIAC offered a, you know, good water, clean air, and a nice uh, environment in which to relax and spend some time. It's much like uh, what happened in the Catskills three generations later. Also amongst the very, very wealthy came to Nyack and began buying old Nyack farms were pretty much played out at the time, mostly in Upper Nyack, but elsewhere. And uh, uh, these were, they were building on these farms, summer homes. So we had big new estates and that's when all of this began in the, in the Gilded Age so they could, you know, have a dock and tie up their boat and commute by boat or train back and forth to the city. The local economy was booming. Um, NIAC took on the appearance pretty much as we have it now in terms of infrastructure. Um, you could get anything you needed in terms of service in NIAC. Uh, the middle class did very, very well in this period. So the shop owners, the professionals, um, they did great. And many of the houses that are built on Broadway um, by the middle class and upper middle class were built at this time. Um, the, on the other side of the coin, uh, the working poor, the major industry in, the, at the, in this period was shoe manufacturing. And that had its ups and downs. The wages were poor, the hours were bad. And, uh, you know, there wasn't uh, a lot of upward mobility for the working class. Many people ended up serving um, in all of those uh, hotels and resorts that were built to service people coming here. So there were jobs in the laundry and waiters and uh, so forth. So uh, we had our own broad um, sweep of people from the very high end, um, very wealthy, coming from outside to NIAC to, you know, the working poor. Trying to move this along. Okay, so uh, our first uh, photographer, our, Isaac Marshall Van Wagner. You see on the right in advertising for one of his um, um, photographic studios, this one on Broadway. Van Wagner had quite a history. He became a photographer at the age of 17, believe it or not. And that's an early age, 1860 for photography. Probably learned it from his father. The next year he volunteered and served in the Civil War and then came to Nyack in the 18, around 1870 and set up a, um, a studio. First studio was on Bird Street. The second studio was not far from there on Broadway. And then he built an entirely new building on South Broadway to house his third studio around 1880. Uh, it was his idea to start a row of uh, brick buildings for business on Lower Broadway. Uh, his was the first at the northwest corner of Broadway, South Broadway and Hudson Avenue. And um, that building, of course, still stands. He had a studio on the first floor and rented out the other area. He lived not far away on the southeast corner of South Broadway and Cedar Hill Avenue. His house was known as the, um, the biggest and fanciest painted lady in town. Not the biggest house, but the, the best painted. Uh, ironically, that house still stands, but it's painted entirely white. So it doesn't look, I don't think, like it did in his time. So as a commercial photographer, he knew lots of people in, in Nyack and did thousands of photographs, a few hundred of which still exist. One type of photograph he took was something called a 
stereoscope. And a stereoscope slide that was used. And what we're seeing here is a stereoscope. So in this, um, this young man is viewing um, on the right, this uh, slides. There's two slides side by side and they can be focused. And when they come into focus, the viewer sees the image in three dimensions. It was a, the stereoscope was very popular in the United States at the time because it brought, you know, this was a time when people hadn't seen a lot of things throughout the world. So they got a chance to see images of the pyramids of Paris, London, you know, really various parts of the world. It was made available because Oliver Wendell Holmes of all invented a very inexpensive stereoscope. I see, I say just an expensive, I should say an inexpensive stereoscope and it did it patent free. So that was easily available to everyone. Van Wagner produced hundreds of these stereoscope slides. He sold them in packages in his store. He sold them through uh, other retailers and photograph studios in New York and Boston and elsewhere. Um, we're going to take a look at one uh, stereoscope, and this is what it actually looked like. It's a little hard to look at um, by itself, but as you'll see in here, first of all, it's from a package called Nyack and Vicinity. And on the right is the identification of the photographer, Isaac Van Wagner. This, of course, is a shot of the Nyack Center, which in the 1870s was called, was the first Presbyterian church. Um, it's easily recognizable, uh, but, you know, it's quite a bit quieter than what we see today. You know, look at these streets, uh, uh, Broadway in the pew. There's no stoplights, there's no stop signs. They're not paved, very, very quiet. Uh, typical of uh, Van Wagner photographs, he leaves certain elements in here. We see this uh, cute little dog on the street. Over here on the right is a young man. It's probably his son and helping him with the photographs. But you'll see the appearance of the Nike Center remains pretty true to this particular photograph. So this is what a stereoscope looked like. It was taken by a special camera, by the way, with two lenses about two inches apart. And then when focused, those created the three-dimensional image. So we're gonna talk about the prospect house first, but before we look at it, I need to just tell you where it is. I've taken this out of a map. This is the prospect house hotel. It had a capacity of 400. So it was a huge building up on South Mountain in South Nyack. You can see the streets, Highland Avenue and Highland Avenue. This intersection of course still exists. Off to the right is Terrace Avenue and today, South um, uh, South Mountain Avenue goes uh, in the in the other direction, so it's a uh, four way stop there. This is a field at the moment. Uh, for many years, it was a soccer field um, on the Nyack College. But you can see the layout of this hotel. It's fairly large. It has a laundry, a stable, and carriage back here. Bowling alley because bowling alley bowling's were very popular then and a few little cottages along the street. So this is where it was in South Nyack. Now, let's take a look at it. Okay, so this is a, uh, and I'm not showing you the stereograph here. I've just simply pulled one half of the image. So because otherwise it's, it's a little difficult to look at. So this is the Prospect House and wow, what a building. It's got everything uh, you can possibly imagine in a Gilded Age building. It's four floors high. It's got the mansard roof, the towers, the wraparound porch, and it's just got everything you can imagine that would be in a building at that time. It had 150 rooms, the dining room alone seated 200, and the ads for it promised it to be one of the healthiest locations when 30 miles in New York City. Uh, we already noticed the staple in the bowling alley, but there were, you know, people could come here, they could ride horses, they could hike, there were a lot of trails in the mountain in South Nyack, they could go. Uh, boating, swimming, um, and uh, things along the river. So it was only open in the summer. So remember, this is a summer resort, so it's June to September was the season for this. You can see in the photograph as well, here's again a young man with a photographic device. Again, it's probably his son. 
And over on the right, uh, a ladder. I think probably he took some other photographs uh, using a ladder. So he, he left these devices in the frame. And it gives us a sense of scale of the size of this building. And boy, look at Hillside Avenue. It's just a little lane. Uh, so, you know, this magnificent building on what's a really a country lane. So um, here's another view, also a stereoscope. This is a view of the front porch. And it had a huge wraparound porch. So you can just imagine what the view was from this height. It, uh, you could see Hook Mountain. Um, you're overlooking Nyack. You could see the Hudson River, Westchester. You can see in those days all the ship traffic that's moving up and down the river. So it had quite a view and probably a pretty good breeze. In this photograph, we see one gentleman sitting here in his hat, uh, fully dressed. He's got his jacket on. Uh, and behind him, uh, a woman and another woman sitting over here. And you can see it, this, this you know, porch would contain a lot, of, a lot of people. So they had a lot of room on it. Uh, the hotel would hold clam bakes and other events in the in the yard. Uh, Grover Cleveland, who we mentioned earlier, was here at least twice uh, on the years between his two terms. Um, in fact, he sat on this porch one evening, trying after dinner, trying to take it easy, and a bunch of his Democratic supporters showed up on the lawn and asked him to speak, so he had to give a, a short talk. He also, on one of the trips, staying here, visited the Nyack, toured the river, and he noticed a really interesting house on the corner of Voorhees and Broadway in Nyack that had a lot of different gables to it. And he was so struck with it, he kept that in mind and designed a house in Falmouth, Massachusetts, on Cape Cod as a home that he later retired to. And he gave it the name. Um, because of the gables as gray gables in memory of the house in Nyack. It's now uh, a historic site. And here's a view that's also a stereoscope from the front yard, if you will, of the prospect house. Again, we have you know, the same young man uh, in the photograph. In the distance, you'll see, uh, you see uh, Hook Mountain. You can kind of imagine where the river is. It doesn't really show well in this photograph, but. You know, the thing that struck me about this is the open fields. There aren't as many trees, so some of these fields are still farmed. So we see both in the foreground and in the middle ground uh, in parts of Nyack, they're still relatively open and not full of houses. So there's a lot of, still a lot of open space in the Nyacks then. The hotel was built around 1870 and it perfectly bracketed the Gilded Age because in 1898, when the season was just getting underway, one day a fire started. They had a hard time getting the small fire under control and it just took off. Now that was a wood building. So you can imagine once that takes off, there's a lot to burn there. And the fire departments were called, but it was impossible to gain any pressure for the fire hoses to pump up the hill. So the hotel burned completely to the ground. And people said they would rebuild it, but it was never rebuilt. So uh, the beautiful Prospect House is one of those lost locations from the Gilded Age. And um, I, I, I hope you enjoyed taking a look at it here. Uh, now we're gonna turn to Frank Brush and take a little, slightly different view. This is a... a Frank Brush was uh, a hobbyist photographer. He lived his entire life at 15 Van Houten Street in Upper Nyack. He worked as a shoemaker, farmer, and a laborer. And in one sense, he's listed as a manager of a greenhouse exporting violets through New York City. So uh, hang on to that thought. We'll, we'll talk about that again in a minute. He married Gertrude Ackerman of a well-known Nyack family. And that's about the time he took up photography. I've included one of his photographs here just to give you a sense of the difference because all of Van Wagner's photographs are staged or posed and Brush tends to take photographs that are more of the moment. So like here, you know, we see this uh, cute little dog on the fence, a woman in a sense of movement in the dress of the day with her hat, her high buttoned um, blouse, and uh, and skirt, 
probably with a bustle, which we can't see in this particular photograph. So the point here is, you know, he took a lot of immediacy in his photographs. Again, I'm gonna give the location so um, we can place this. We're gonna take a look at Undercliff, which was an estate in a house built by Arthur C. Tucker. Um, Undercliff was the name. Um, it was built in 1885 at 649 North Broadway. And you can see in this uh, um, map of it, first of all, to get you located, this is Broadway, North Broadway. The little road leading down is the road, much as it is today, to Nyack Beach State Park. It was not a state park at that time. Um, it, the front of the river, um, notice the little driveways that go around the estate. There's a dock in the river. Uh, on um, the south side is the stable, and the land went all the way up in a strip to 9W. This is Larchdale Avenue and Midland Avenue. So those are the streets that are still there. Uh, the thing I want you to uh, take a look at is here at the corner of Larchdale and Midland is a set of greenhouses. So while Tucker was, um, didn't have to work, uh, he had a lot of inherited money, he did um, work as a gentleman farmer. And as well as having an orchard on his property, he raised roses and violets for export to the New York City market. It's indeed possible that Frank Brush worked with him on that and made a connection and hence the reason for the photographs we're about to see. Anayak, by the way, was a thrive, had a thriving uh, greenhouse business. There were six or seven of them in this interval that exported uh, plants to New York City. Okay, uh, here's a brush photograph. And I have to give credit to my uh, um, exhibit co-curator, Lee Hoffman, who's a trustee with the Historical Society for doing some really great um, digital remastering of the originals so that you can see the detail. And it just, uh, to me, this photograph really, really pops. This is a view of Undercliff. We're looking at it from Broadway with a, um, a driveway that we saw on the map. It's a white crushed stone. It's a house of, was built actually in a year, believe it or not. Um, it's 22 rooms designed by a New York City architect, W.H. Smith. And the first floor had things like the dining room, kitchen, parlor, billiard room, sitting room, office, butler's pantry, and so forth. The second floor had bedrooms um, for the family. The third bedroom would have um, uh, bedrooms for the, for the servants. And you'll see over on the right, uh, on the driveway, it had a porta cachure. So it's kind of hiding behind the bush there a little bit. But that allowed people arriving by carriage to get out in the weather without being rained on and move on to the front porch. The house was heated with steam heat. Of course, again, it was a summer house, so it would close up uh, after September or early October. So heat wasn't quite the same requirement. It's one innovation, it had gas lighting and it had an electric starter. This was uh, shortly built shortly before the time that Nyack was electrified. Um, here's a detail just to give you um, which I think is really cool. Um, just to look at some of the elements here, here's the second floor bedroom window with shingles. It has an awning above it, a Juliet balcony with this um, nice little cornice, a fish scale uh, shingles that contrast with the square shingles above and the clapboards below. And we have the lintel piece here. I think this is the library has like two stained glass windows in this uh, projecting bay. On the right, we see a few of the porch with a few uh, chairs. This is the turret itself, which is 65 feet tall. You can see through this particular room. And over here on the left is what I believe is the uh, kitchen. Down below, we see the uh, door open to the basement because it did have a basement as well. So a lot of details that in and of themselves, you'd say this can't work as a design. There are just too many things going on. But when you step back from the house as a whole, it really, it really comes together in, the, in a wonderful design. Here's another view by Frank Rush of the, uh, f taking from um, uh, the South, looking towards 
uh, Hook Mountain in the background. So you can see why it got the name Undercliff. It really feels like it's under the cliff. And we're on the river side. So Broadway would be over here. Uh, you can see that the, the terraced uh, landscaping is really, really extensive. So a lot of landscaping here and the white crushed stone bill uh, driveway running around here. So we get a slightly different sense of what the house is like how the Queen Anne Victorian turret sort of separate is separated element from the house itself. A third view, and again, an entirely different view. This is swiveling around, again, pretty much from the riverside looking north to south. And lo and behold, we have the first floor on this side is painted white. We saw the kitchen earlier was painted white, but it's painted all the way around. And you would never expect that. It sort of has the feeling of a cake to me, you know, a layered cake of two, two different layers with a lot of decoration on top. And so the house is really full of a lot of surprises. Uh, here's another Frank Brush photograph. And uh, it shows what I think is uh, the driveway around on the property near the river. In the background is Hook Mountain. This is Hook Mountain before the quarry. So it looks really different than it does now. Uh, you can see the extensive landscaping here, the stone wall. And I believe the location is just about where his uh, dock would be. There was one other house between under cliff and, uh, and the hook. And you can see its dock right here. Also another a photograph attributed to Frank Brush is this photograph of a man in a carriage. Again, I think it's of the estate because it's on the same type of crushed stone driveway. We have the Hudson River in the background. We have the uh, Terrytown and the Westchester Hills in the distance. And we have what is really a nice looking carriage and a nice looking horse, by the way. So. I think this just may be a photograph of Arthur C. Tucker himself with one of his children. Um, and we see him decked out in a bowler hat and a mustache, which was the, um, the look of the day. The Civil War beards were long gone and mustaches were the style in this era. He has on the high button jacket. He's dressed well, he has his driving gloves, and he's all set to go. So I think this is a nice portrait of Arthur C. Tucker. Also on the property is the stable or carriage house. And oh my goodness, uh, I'm, you can guess at what the square footage of this would be. It would make a really nice dwelling today. And it, like the house, has all the architectural elements um, of a classic Gilded Age Victorian. So, uh, you know, it is clearly a staple, but it's got everything going for it. Now we're gonna take a look at uh, the interior. Uh, this is a shot of the library looking into the parlor. We know it's a library because we have uh, these hardcover books in the cases here. Uh, you'll notice the place is just chock a full, block full of all kinds of elements. There is nothing undesigned, nothing plain and simple in it. Uh, the wallpaper, you know, you have one pattern here, you have a, a crown piece of molding, then a crown um, strip of wallpaper that's different than the wall itself, and finally a crown molding, and then either a painted or wallpapered roof. Here is the chandelier that's lit by gas. Uh, you'll see uh, vases and other items on the shelves. Here's a, a, a picture leaning against the wall. They didn't seem to hang any pictures in this, um, in, in this residence. They all seem to be leaning. And we get a view back into um, what is probably the parlor. We have the fretwork above the door, extensive woodwork uh, around it and this uh, very cool little drapery here uh, to separate the two rooms rather than have a door. We have one other uh, interior view. This is of, I think, the dining room, though it doesn't look big enough to me, but it is uh, definitely a dining table. We see uh, the china cabinet on the left. 
Uh, again, the different elements of, of uh, wallpaper, uh, the treatment above the door, and we're looking back into another room, which has a, a frame photograph, again, leaning on a chair, not on the wall. And uh, one element that intrigued uh, Lee Hoffman and myself was this mirror um, that you see here, because reflected in that mirror is a piano. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure out where the heck a piano is anywhere in this space, trying to work out the geometry of it. And we never really did. So I invite you to attend the museum and take a look at this. And if you can figure it out, you know, please let us know. So uh, that's the outside and the inside of a quintessential Gilded Age mansion of it, the type that came to Nyack in, in the, the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. Uh, I will say this, the building um, lasted not very long. Uh, the kind of the next owners uh, who purchased it around the time of World War I uh, was another industrialist whose second wife really didn't like the style of architecture and she demolished the house. In its place uh, is built a Neo-Georgian um, brick building, which has gone through a lot of additions and renovations over time. And that building still stands at 649 Broadway. So like the Prospect House, Undercliff is a lost building. Now, last, we're going to conclude with just a comparison uh, shot of the Nyack Rowing Association Clubhouse. Uh, the clubhouse was built uh, at the foot of Spear Street on an old dock. So it, uh, looking at this uh, photograph, it projects out into the river. And again, it's another iconic Gilded Age uh, building. It has really a lot of things going for it. Um, the um, uh, Browing was a popular sport at the time. Really, in the Gilded Age, all the sports we have today um, came of prominence, whether it was football, baseball, golf, tennis, rowing, bicycling. They all became really, really popular when people had more leisure time. And rowing was really, really popular. So you would find rowing clubs along the Hudson River. You know, several still exist in uh, the Fordham and Columbia houses on, in, in Manhattan. But there were uh, clubhouses in Yonker, Piermont, Poughkeepsie. But you know, the Nyack clubhouse was pretty special and a little more ornate than most of them. And it would also be the first thing people saw when they came up the river, as many people did to see Nyack, they would see this ornate building. Uh, just to give it a little uh, uh, um, character on the first floor was where the boats and oars and so forth were kept. On the second floor was the social room. So they had parties and dances and dinners there. On the third floor was the dressing rooms and back uh, up in the top of the tower was a billiard room. So that was the real man cave. Um, and in later years, after this photograph was taken, a bowling alley was built in this part of the um, part of the um, uh, dock. So that was the Nyack Rowing Association, which started in 1882. Uh, this building was built in less than a year, believe it or not, uh, and it was funded by subscriptions. So Isaac Van Wagner's photograph on the left is a posed photograph, as we might expect from a commercial photographer. If we look, were, look carefully at the gentleman on this ramp here, we'll see they're all looking at the camera. So they know they're having their picture taken. Uh, some of them have uh, working smocks on, so they have been doing some sort of work in the, uh, in the, in the uh, storeroom. On the second floor, we see a gentleman standing here also looking at the camera. And on this floor uh, off to the right are um, a group of women. So. You know, women were not allowed to be members of the rowing club. I'm not sure they were allowed to row, but they were allowed to participate in social events, at least girlfriends and wives of members. And they certainly were allowed to participate in helping all the fundraising socials that they needed to uh, provide funds to keep, keep it going. So just to place this a little further, this is a photograph taken from the water. In the background is South Mountain and South Nyack. 
On the right is a building that is uh, still stands at the end of the canal that um, that now has a bridge over over Memorial Park. So Memorial Park would be kind of in the back of back of this. On the right, we have a photograph by Frank Brush of the of the Rowing Association Clubhouse. Brush treats it a little differently. He frames the photograph up with these various um, with the trees here. It's taken probably from an angle in Memorial Park. This would be a time when you know it was taken from slightly up above because the bottom part of Memorial Park was only created after with um, throughway fill in the 1950s. Um, characteristically of Frank Brush, something's going on here. The flags are flying. There's the U.S. flag. There is a club flag, and if a careful look at this, you'll see that the the uh, second floor balcony is about four or five people deep all the way around. On the dock are some referees. There's a, on the right is a small steamboat. So the regatta is going on. And this is actually a time when races would happen of various, various lengths, both one and two person. Um, boats would race and uh, they were very, very popular. So uh, what Brant Brush has captured is something of the moment in his photograph in a very different composition from the commercial photographer. So um, that is the three locations that I wanted to put in front of you that to me characterize the Gilded Age Nyack. None of these buildings exist. The, the uh, Rowing Association Clubhouse disappeared, became after the Rowing Club, a um, a boat yard, and then was destroyed in a Northeaster on Thanksgiving Day in 1950. So the Prospect House, Undercliff, and the Rowing Club Clubhouse no longer exist. So we only have these pictures of the Gilded Age through these photographs by our two photographers, Isaac Van Wenger and Frank Brush. Um, I encourage you to visit the museum, which is open one to four every Saturday, or you can arrange for a special appointment at info at nyachistory.org. There you can see a full range, many, many more photographs than we've looked at. You will see glass negatives. You get a chance to use an antique stereoscope with 10 Van Wagner slides that are specially remastered for this exhibit. So um, with that, I'm going to close and I'll open it up to any questions we may have.